A series of events occurred over 200 years ago that brought about huge changes in the way that people lived. That was the time when fast power-driven machines started to do work that up until that time had only been done by human hands. It was when the first big factories were built to house workers and the machines they operated. It was when the production of manufactured goods increased dramatically. When the lives of human beings first started to be regulated by clocks and factory bells. It was also when rural populations declined as people headed to factories to find steady work. When cities rapidly grew and when pollution of the environment began to occur on a massive scale. Taken together, these events started the world's first industrial revolution. Before the industrial revolution began in England around the year 1760, the way most people lived in Europe and America was very different from how they live today. Nine out of ten people lived in rural areas. There was a large, mostly poor lower class, a small, rich upper class, and not much of a middle class. Rural people raised most of their food on small farms, and they didn't have to leave home each day to work at their jobs. Back then, there were no electric lights, no movies, no telephones, no recorded music, and no cars. Ordinary people used their hands to make most of the things they needed. They had no reason to own a clock, since their lives were tuned to the rising and setting of the sun. The world was pretty quiet before the Industrial Revolution, because there were no machines for rapid transportation to fill the air with noise. Without these devices, people didn't travel much. Consequently, except for their own villages, they knew very little about the world in which they lived. The pace of life was much slower before the Industrial Revolution because people had to walk or use horses to move from place to place. There was no public education, so few people could read and write. And due to poor nutrition and living conditions, they didn't live nearly as long as people do today. Textile manufacturing was the first major industry to undergo industrialization. And for many people, the change was tragic. That was because before the Industrial Revolution, the poor rural population had few ways of earning a living, except for the unreliable income they got from farming. But in Europe especially, many rural people could add to their incomes by working at what were known as domestic or cottage industries by making cloth. The way this worked was that cloth merchants purchased large quantities of wool from sheep farmers, as well as linen fibers from flax farmers. The merchants then delivered the material to cottage workers to be made into cloth. First the fibers were spun into yarn using a simple foot-powered machine called a spinning wheel. Then, under what was known as the putting out system, the yarn was then distributed to weavers to be woven into certain types of cloth on a hand loom. It took a long time, but after the roll of cloth was finished, the merchants paid the cottage workers for what they had done. These traditional home-based textile workers were the first people to be replaced by machines when the Industrial Revolution began. In the 1760s, Two new machines, the spinning jenny and the water frame, caused a revolution in the textile industry because both machines markedly sped up the process of making thread for weaving. These machines were adapted to use the power of flowing water or hydraulic power. This means that the motion of the water would turn a wheel that was connected by a complicated system of pulleys and belts used to run the machines. Another machine, called the spinning mule, was developed later in the 1700s. When it was hooked up to water power, just one person could do the work of 3,000 hand spinners. The new textile machines were extremely efficient at producing the fine thread needed to make high-quality cloth, 
and they caused the cottage spinning industry to collapse soon after they were introduced. A little later, mechanized power looms were developed that used water power instead of human muscle power to weave thread into cloth. One important invention adapted to power weaving from hand looms was a mechanized version of the flying shuttle seen here. This was a special device used to rapidly weave a cross thread through the webs of thread on the loom. On power looms, this process took place at an incredible speed when compared to doing it by hand. It is not surprising that the much more efficient power looms rapidly ended the cottage weaving industry. In England in 1811, unemployed home textile workers called the Luddites got so angry about losing their jobs that they rioted and tried to destroy the new textile machines. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, large buildings called factories began to appear along rivers in Europe and North America. Factories are places where workers operating expensive, usually very complicated machines, produce manufactured goods. The creation of factories was a turning point in human society because people had to leave home each day to earn a living. This radically changed family life and the way children were raised. New housing for workers had to be built near the factories and as this happened, cities rapidly grew in size while rural populations decreased. And because people had to meet production deadlines, they were expected to show up at the factories at specific times. This meant that for the first time in history, large numbers of human lives began to be regulated by clocks and the ringing of factory bells. For example, the schedule seen here shows that in 1874, the long workday at the Lowell Mills began at 6.45 in the morning and ended at 6 in the evening, except on Saturday, when it ended at 4.30. On Sunday, however, workers were given a day off. The Industrial Revolution came to America mainly through two instances of what today would be called industrial espionage, or industrial spying. The spying occurred because the designs of English textile machines were carefully guarded secrets. They had brought England so much wealth that laws prohibited shipping the machines out of the country for fear that people might copy them. The first case of industrial spying took place sometime in the 1780s when a man who had been employed at an English spinning factory named Samuel Slater memorized every detail of how the machines were built. He moved to the United States the year George Washington was elected president and had copies made of the English machines. Then he opened up a cotton spinning mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island and put them to work. And by the beginning of the 19th century, 100 workers, mostly women and children aged 7 to 14, could be found laboring here at Slater's Mill. The second case of espionage that brought the Industrial Revolution to America produced copies of English power looms which were first employed in the United States in the year 1814. Like the design of the spinning machine, the design of the power loom had been secretly memorized from English machines. And once America had power looms, it rapidly became an important textile manufacturing nation. Even though the first mechanical spinning and weaving machines in America were copied from English machines, one truly American invention, called the cotton gin, helped revolutionize the textile industry. Cotton plants produced excellent fibers, and in America's southern states, cotton was very cheap to produce because unpaid slaves were used to grow and harvest the crop. Yet even though the demand for cotton was great, before the invention of the cotton gin, it was not widely used in textiles. That was because cotton fibers are contained in the plant's seed pods, and before the fiber can be spun into threads, 
the seeds must be removed. Cleaning cotton was a very slow process when done by hand. But after 1793, the year Eli Whitney invented his cotton gin, simply by turning a crank, it was possible to remove as many seeds from raw cotton in a single day as 50 people could do using just their hands. Because the cotton gin made the fibers more readily available, there was a great increase in cotton production. Consequently, there was an increase in the number of slaves working on plantations as well. After the invention of the cotton gin, the raising of cotton rapidly became the backbone of the economy in the southern United States. Besides inventing the cotton gin, Eli Whitney also came up with a new method of making things that helped revolutionize manufacturing. That was the idea of having interchangeable parts. Before the Industrial Revolution, each tool or machine was made by hand, one at a time. In fact, an important job of the blacksmith in pre-industrial times was to make replacement parts when a piece of equipment got broken, which was a very time-consuming process. For example, if a lock like this one stopped working, it was not possible to fix it with off-the-shelf parts, because each lock was one of a kind, and its parts could not be interchanged. The situation began to change in 1798, when Eli Whitney got an order from the U.S. government for 10,000 rifles that needed to be delivered in a very short period of time. To meet the deadline, he developed a method of manufacturing guns that were nearly identical to one another, so that a part for one rifle would work in any other rifle of the same kind. Making interchangeable parts not only sped up the manufacturing process for the rifles. If they failed to shoot, it made fixing them a lot quicker and easier to do. Whitney's method of using interchangeable parts was a big step forward in manufacturing and eventually led to greatly increased production of almost all machine-made goods. While at the same time, the blacksmith's job became much less important. During the 19th century, while the southern states developed a slave-based agricultural economy, the New England states became the center of America's Industrial Revolution. There were several reasons why industrialization took hold in New England. First, the region's many large rivers provided excellent sources of water power. Second, it was easier for New Englanders to shift to an economy based on manufacturing due to the fact that the area's rocky soil was poorly suited for farming. Third, New England had a number of fine seaports that could be used for bringing in raw materials and transporting out finished goods. And fourth, thanks to decades of success in the transatlantic shipping business, there were people in New England with large sums of money who wanted to invest in factories. When the Industrial Revolution began in England, the earliest textile factories employed many young children and paid them almost nothing. But that changed in America because by the mid-1800s, eight out of every ten workers in the textile factories were unmarried women between the ages of 15 and 30. Most of them had left behind quiet lives on isolated farms for the adventure of working in a city and earning a steady wage. The conditions were not good in the textile factories, but they did improve over time. The machines tended to be extremely loud and dangerous to operate. The hours were long. The work was quite monotonous, and the air in the factories was filled with tiny bits of fiber that damaged the workers' lungs. The wages were low as well. The mill girls, as they were called, earned less than three dollars for putting in a six-day 60-hour work week, while men got a dollar more a week for doing the same jobs. The lives of the mill girls were almost completely controlled by the factories where they worked. For example, right across the street from this textile factory are the company-owned boarding houses where they slept and ate their meals. Here, the girls were carefully supervised and followed a strict curfew, 
but they were provided with respectable surroundings that were often more comfortable than those they had known back on the farm. However, as the 19th century rolled on, unskilled factory jobs began to be filled more and more often by recent immigrants to America instead of farm girls. Such jobs provided many immigrant families with a reliable income with which to start their new lives. The switch from water to steam power sped up the Industrial Revolution and led to huge changes in manufacturing, farming, and transportation. Factories that started using steam engines were more efficient than water-powered factories and could be built far away from rivers. Steam engines also began to be used to run machines for mass transportation, such as railroads and steamboats and this made it possible for people to travel long distances in a very short amount of time. The use of steam engines in farming for things such as threshing grain led to greatly increased food production and helped to revolutionize agriculture. But because steam engines burned wood or coal, smokestacks became a very familiar sight and air pollution increased to the point that it began to cause serious health problems in the industrial cities. Naturally, as the popularity of steam-powered machines grew, the appetite for coal and iron increased as well. More and more mines were developed to supply industry, and large-scale mining itself resulted in tremendous environmental damage in many parts of the world. By the year 1900, industrialization was firmly in place across much of Europe and America. The century that had just ended had been one of drastic, rapid change on a scale unlike anything seen before in history. Huge numbers of rural people had moved to crowded cities and taken up factory work. Many of them now lived in homes illuminated with electric light bulbs. Their children attended public schools. They could listen to recorded music in their homes instead of going to a concert hall. They could even watch motion pictures, talk on the telephone, and ride in an automobile. For the Industrial Revolution had ushered in the modern age, and with it came not only tremendous technological and environmental changes, but a brand new middle class of hard-working people as well. True or false, cottage industries replaced textile factories after the Industrial Revolution. True or false, interchangeable parts were developed by Eli Whitney. True or false, most of the new textile machines of the 18th century were invented in the USA. True or false, cotton gins were used to remove seeds from cotton fibers. True or false, in the 19th century, steam engines were mainly used to remove pollutants from the air. True 